All right, guys, welcome back to the channel and thanks for dropping by. In this session, I'll demonstrate how I rendered this vector-based portrait of Sypha, the elegant and erudite elemental witch of Wallachia, as she's recently been portrayed in Netflix's animated Castlevania series. As per usual, I'll be working in Affinity Designer on iPad OS, but everything I'll cover here can be achieved on the desktop versions as well. This piece is primarily vector-based and took about two hours to complete. If you'd like to follow along, just use the link in the description to download the session files from my Gumroad page. If you're just along for the ride, that's cool too. Let's get started. Once you've downloaded the session files, open up Affinity Designer on your iPad and tap the plus symbol to create a new document. Then tap New from Template. Locate and select the template file and you should see the lovely cipher here. Aside from a few masks, this portrait is 100% vector. Some of you might be asking yourselves, why complete a drawing of this type using vector tools? Wouldn't that take longer? Wouldn't it be more difficult or more frustrating? As for the last two questions, the answer is yes, it could take longer and it could be more frustrating, but that's only if you don't understand how best to utilize your tools. As for the why? Well, personally, I'm just addicted to using vector drawing tools. They present some challenges at first, but once you become confident using them, they open up worlds of possibility. In this session, I intend to cover as many tips and tricks as I possibly can to help shed some light on some of those possibilities. After a brief setup, I'll take you through the key moments in both the inking and coloring processes. If I leave something out, or if you're curious about something that I've done, you can always reopen and refer to the layer stack in the original template file. I've left it all there for you. For this session, I've provided a simple set of vector brushes and some style presets which will come in handy. Let's get them installed. First, open up the Brush Studio. From the drop-down menu in the top right corner of the panel, tap Import Brushes. Then locate and select the brush file. To import the styles, first open the FX Studio, then tap on the Styles tab. From the drop down menu, select Import Styles, then locate and select the file. There are two of these, so we'll just repeat the process for the second one. We have one set for our blunt brushes and one for our tapered brushes. We'll get more into that momentarily. Once we enter the coloring phase, we'll be using this document palette I made using the character sheets from Federator Studios. I also made one for Alucard and Trevor in case you get inspired and want to try rendering this most triumphant trio. Document palettes are awesome. They are embedded in the document, so they'll always be there for us whenever we open the file, no matter which device we choose to work from. Creating your own palette from a reference image is easy to do. As I mentioned in my recent Affinity Creative session, I like to use Safari for this, as it allows us to drag and drop images directly onto our spread. Once the image is on our spread, we can use the Move tool to reposition and resize it. With the Move tool selected, click, hold, and drag the image to reposition it. To resize it, click, hold, and drag on one of the little blue nodes appearing at the corners. By default, using the corner handles, the image should maintain the correct aspect ratio. Now 
With the image now resized, snap to center and selected, we can rename it and lock it into place from the Layer Studio. Now, from the Color Studio Preferences menu, choose Add Document Palette. To rename the palette, again, from the Preferences menu, choose Rename Palette and type or write in the name. Next, using the Color Picker tool, Simply tap on a color to select it. Once a color is selected, in the Studio Preferences menu, select Add Current Fill to Palette, and it will appear in the palette. If we put our palette into list mode, we can see that our colors are also labeled. By default, colors are labeled by either RGB or CMYK depending on the color profile of the document. To change these labels, simply tap and hold on the swatch briefly. Then, from the pop-up menu, select Rename. This third swatch doesn't quite match the swatch from the character sheet. No biggie. We can easily delete it and replace it like so. Now that everything is where it ought to be as far as our tools are concerned, let's take a closer look at those brushes and styles. There's nothing particularly fancy about the brushes. I've set them up this way because it is faster, easier, and more consistent than constantly adjusting and readjusting the size of a single brush from the context menu. With the brush tool selected, I'll choose one of the brushes and draw a line or two. Take notice of the controller setting in the Brush Tools context menu. It is set to None, and so there is no pressure data accompanying the strokes I've just drawn. If I set the controller to Pressure, I can then imbue my strokes with the pressure data that coincides with the settings of the brush I've chosen to draw with. The Brush Default setting works just fine for our purposes as well. As you can see here, there are two types of brushes in our set. There are blunt brushes and tapered brushes. A tapered brush will taper to a very fine point, whereas a blunt brush will not fully taper. Let's take a closer look at how this works. A brief tap and hold on a brush reveals a pop-up menu. From there, if we select Edit, we can view and edit the brush settings of that particular brush. For the blunt brushes, I've raised the start of the curve quite high and kept the input relatively mild. These brushes are intended to be used like liners. They're great for outlining close curves or shapes and for drawing connective or tangent strokes. Now let's take a look at the tapered brushes. Pay special attention to the starting position of the input curve. I've offset it just a bit and I've opted for a slightly unusual slide type curve as opposed to a doubling or exponential curve. 
This small offset at the beginning helps me produce a very sharp point at the ends of my strokes using a very light touch, almost no pressure at all. When I do apply pressure, the slide type curve provides a bit of buffer for me so that too much pressure data is not applied to the curve causing bloated or blown out looking lines. Consistently reproducing this type of line quality is one of the trickiest parts of using vector tools. You'll need to experiment with the settings in order to accommodate your physicality. You'll also need to take into account your global pressure settings found under Pencil in Affinity Designer's main preferences menu. Once you've found your sweet spot, you'll be ready to tackle the inking phase. All right, here I've drawn a simple curve using one of the tapered brushes. If we open up the Stroke Studio, we can take a look at the curve data. It doesn't look too bad, right? If we tap, hold, and drag, we can edit and reposition nodes as desired. We can delete unwanted nodes by tapping on them and selecting Delete Node from the pop-up menu. We can also add nodes by tapping on the curve in the spaces lying in between nodes. We can even reset the entire curve by selecting Reset Pressure. As you can see, editing these curves is simple enough, but this can often be time consuming and repetitive. That's where the style presets really shine. Let's open up the Effects Studio and navigate to the Styles tab. Essentially, a style is a perfect copy of all the data that makes up the cosmetic appearance of a curve object. I've come to think of the Styles tab as a kind of wardrobe for my curves. Different outfits for different occasions. While vector inking, I have found that there are really only a handful of pressure curves that consistently reappear. I've included those curves in this set as well as a few utility curve types. One set will imbue your strokes with a blunt brush type as well as the desired pressure curve the other, a tapered brush type and pressure curve. When assigning a style, the brush size of the style will override the size used to draw the curve. That's not a problem, and it's part of the reason I built the brush set the way that I have. With the brush tool selected, a two finger press and hold allows us to select the previously drawn curve. While selected in this way, we can audition and assign different brush types to the curve. So, as you can see, with this kit, you can quickly and easily assign the desired pressure curve, approximate stroke widths, and brush types to your curves. To get that highly personalized experience, I recommend taking some time to build your own library of styles at some point. They can save a ton of time and help you keep pace moving forward. All right, let's open up the Layer Studio, delete the final artwork, and make the sketch layer visible. Don't worry, if you want to go back and look at something later on, this is a template file, so make changes freely. Upon reopening the template file, everything will be there as it was when you first opened it. Next, hit the plus symbol at the top of the Layer Studio to add a layer. From the menu, select Vector Layer. Adding a vector layer before beginning to ink a new section of your illustration is a really important habit to pick up. Once you've added and selected the new vector layer, subsequently drawn curves will appear neatly stacked inside. If we skip this step or simply forget to do this, before we know it, we can end up with a really messy project. Next, I recommend making sure you can rotate your canvas. If we open the Navigation Studio, you will see circular controllers for both rotation and zoom. By default, rotation is locked on new documents. That is, unless Allow Canvas Rotation is enabled in Affinity Designer's Main Preferences area, you can find this option under the Tools heading.
Canvas rotation can be a bit of a crutch if used too often, but occasionally it can be a real time saver when you're suddenly struggling with a particularly troublesome angle or line. In the Navigation Studio, we can also change the main viewing mode for our document. It might sound strange, but I sometimes like to change the view mode from vector view to pixel view while inking. Pixel view mode allows us to view an accurate representation of how our work will appear once exported as a flat image. One day, while inking a piece in Pixel Persona, I began to notice the difference in my perception and how it changed the way that I approached the work. There was something about the ultra crisp quality of the lines while inking with curves in vector view that seemed somehow wrong or unsettling to me. It also occurred to me that drawing in pixel view might somehow improve the performance of the device. I imagined that it somehow cut down on the amount of data the app would need to process zooming in and out of different sections of the illustration. I looked into this on the Affinity forums and was assured that this is definitely not the case. In somewhat related news, Affinity just announced a major software improvement for Affinity 1.10 that dramatically improves the rendering performance of all the apps in the Affinity suite. They've also said that the improvement is software-based, so the performance boost will be seen across all platforms, including iPadOS. I'm super excited for it. I doubt that I'll ever need to, but it's nice to know that I'll be able to smoothly zoom in and out while rendering 200,000 vector objects at nearly 60 FPS. Anyhow, I just wanted to share my funky little view mode experiment with you. Try it out and let me know what you think in the comments. While working with the brush tool, we're given stabilizer options that can help us create cleaner, smoother line work. To access these options, tap on the small white arrow to the right of the context menu. Here, with pressure controls enabled, I've slowly drawn a short line without enabling stabilization. It's pretty wobbly and probably has way too many nodes. It's definitely not the quality of line I'm looking for. Now, let's take another crack at it, only this time I'll enable the rope stabilizer. I used roughly the same speed and pressure that I had before, but take a look at the difference in results. I produced a much smoother and cleaner line. Take notice of how it works. You can see that it kind of drags a length of string or rope behind where the pencil is actually pressing. The rope stabilizer here is specialized for drawing long flowing curves or lines. I usually shorten the length of the stabilizer quite a bit. This enables me to draw with a little more speed. Generally, the longer the stabilizer setting, the more care you'll need to take controlling the line. Take a look at this though. Pay special attention to what happens here. Can you see the sharp break in momentum and direction at the tight turn? The rope stabilizer just doesn't handle tight turns or corners very well at all. That's what the window stabilizer is for. Can you see the difference while drawing with the window stabilizer? It rounds the corner very smoothly and doesn't appear to lose any momentum. With a small adjustment to the length of the stabilizer, we can produce that beautiful and expressive line quality we're looking for, even if the line possesses tight turns or oscillations. As I've said many times before, Dealing with unwanted overlaps or line segments is a recurring theme while inking with vector tools. Here, without thinking too much about it, I've inked a line using a tapered brush. However, the line I'm drawing here doesn't taper at the ends. Enter the Vector Crop tool. As you can see, when used, it creates a rectangular cropping frame around the previously drawn or selected vector curve. You can manipulate the blue rectangular handles in order to resize the frame. And that's really all there is to this tool. While it is relatively limited, the vector crop tool remains a very quick and easy way to conceal unwanted overlaps.
When your curves start to pile up, grouping will help keep you organized, and it's super easy. A one finger tap or a swipe across a layer will select it. After a layer is selected, swiping across other layers will add them to the selection. Once you've selected everything that you wish to group, tap on the Group button at the top of the Layer Studio and you're all set. More often than not, swiping to select can become quite tedious. After tapping on the initial layer, a two-finger tap on the last layer of a desired grouping will select everything in between. After only a short time working, you will undoubtedly notice situations begging for the use of one of the shape tools. For example, here, the ellipse tool will help us quickly knock out the large elliptical shape found on the collar or hood of Cypher's cloak. By tapping on the shape tool, we can access the shape tool's menu and select the ellipse tool. While using the shape tool, we can open the color and stroke studios and set the appearance of the curve before we begin to draw. Here, I've set the stroke to black and I've removed the fill. Drawing with the shape tool is super simple. You simply tap and drag out the shape from a certain point on the canvas. Once drawn, you can manipulate its dimensions using the blue nodes or handles, and you can rotate it using the white rotation handle centered at the top. Once we've got a rough approximation of what we need, we can convert the shape to a curve using the Convert to Curves button in the Context menu. Then, we can switch over to the Node tool to further sculpt our newly minted vector curve. Here, I've used a two-finger press and hold gesture to select the curve. While selected in this way, I open the Brush Studio and audition one of the brushes to give myself a better idea about the size of the stroke that I'm after. Moving on, I apply one of the style presets in the Effects Studio. After circling back and settling on the appropriate size brush, I make a few final adjustments with the Node tool. The Bend tool is extremely versatile. Let's take a look at a few use cases. The Pen Tool's default mode is Pen Mode. Pen Mode allows for extremely precise real-time curve drawing. However, we can also exploit Pen Mode by simply laying down a series of well-placed nodes which we can edit later. Before beginning to draw, I usually set the stroke to Null so I can see the lines that I'm tracing. Next, I quickly tap out some nodes along the line I'm attempting to ink. I strategically place them at points of tangency, curvature, or reverse curvature. These are just some fancy words for points where the Bezier curve starts, stops, bends, or breaks off in another direction. As with other tools, I can begin editing the characteristics of my curve while I'm in the process of drawing. I start by opening the Brush Studio and applying a thin, tapered brush. Then, from the Styles tab of the Effects Studio, I apply the Hill preset from the Tapered Solid Inks group. The Pen Tool also provides a limited selection of the editing options normally available while using the Node Tool. We can access them by tapping on the small white arrow to the left of the context menu. I can see clearly that the center three nodes will have to be rounded and smoothed out. I can quickly smooth the curve by selecting the Smooth option. This will convert all the sharp nodes to smooth nodes, giving us access to the editing handles. From there, if you've placed your nodes well, editing them should become much easier. Next, I put the pen tool into edit mode by tapping the icon to the left of the mode selection menu. Remember, a two finger press and hold will select a curve and allow us to make edits. Well, when edit mode is enabled, it is as though a two finger press and hold has been temporarily locked until edit mode has been turned off. This frees up our fingers for all the fun poking, dragging, and nudging that we'll need to do.
Next, we'll tackle the long curve that makes up the outer edge of the cloak's hood. By putting the pen tool into smart mode, we can effectively skip the smoothing step we took in the previous example. Nodes created while using the pen tool in smart mode are not sharp, but are smart nodes or smart corners. I'm obviously not a programmer, and I'm not exactly sure about how smart nodes differ from smooth nodes mathematically. However, what I am sure of is that they are super convenient and easy to edit. They save us time by removing a few extra steps as well, and that's great. Again here, once I've drawn my curve, I'll assign a style preset and brush to the curve to quickly achieve the overall look I'm after with the line. After making some simple edits to the pressure curve, I'll then enter edit mode again and proceed to edit the curve. Once you get comfortable with your tools, you'll probably subconsciously start seeking out ways to use your different tools. It feels great when it clicks and you know exactly what to do to tackle that next line. Here's a great little spot where we can use one of our blunt liner type brushes. Here, we can use the pen tool to quickly knock out the brooch or clasp on Cypher's cloak. Notice how these corners are slightly rounded. We don't want that. Referring to the character sheet, we can see that this is a sharp metal object. The edges of the clasp are quite pointed. By changing the node and joint types, we can create sharpened edges at the vertices of our shape. In some cases, a point may not appear at the corners of the shape. In these cases, we can often produce one by increasing the miter limit, like so. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was adding in his nose, and he was super happy. He didn't have a care in the. Wait a minute! Since we're already using the pen tool, let's finish up the line work on our oversized cloak in line mode. Line mode is super useful. Essentially, in line mode, you can drag out a line from point A to point B. Once your line has been drawn, you can toggle to edit mode, edit your line, toggle back, and begin drawing a new line right away. This is great for knocking out areas of an illustration that have a lot of simple and repetitive lines or arcs. Well, here we are again at one of those moments. We've got to deal with these overlaps, but what is the best way to do it? Every situation is different. We could edit the lines, but getting the stroke, pressure curve, and length just right could be a bit too micro. If you've seen some of my other videos, you'll know that you can always add a mask and conceal the areas with black. But here's a cool feature that you might not know about. First, let's group the lines together and then switch over to Pixel Persona. Grabbing the eraser tool, I can begin erasing the vector curves. It's not really erasing them. 
The assistant is automatically adding a mask when I use the eraser tool on the vector curves in this way. It saves you the steps of adding the mask, switching over to the brush tool, choosing a brush, selecting the black as the concealer. You just skip over all of that and get right to the masking. Remember also that masks only have an effect on the group within which they reside. So the mask will not be intrusive when we begin the coloring phase. Pretty sweet, right? Gotta love that assistant. In the main preferences area under assistant options, you can check out some of the other ways that you can set up your assistant to improve your workflow. Super sweet. With masking fresh on your mind, you probably noticed that we're going to have to take care of the cloak where it overlaps the neck here as well. Eventually, our ink layers will sit on top of our color layer in the layer stack and those lines will become a problem. So again, we have to eliminate an area of unwanted overlap. Switching back over to Vector Persona, we can see that the Vector Crop tool really isn't a good choice here because it masks or hides things from the outside in, essentially framing them. Yeah, I could use the eraser tool, but I've already shown you that. And besides, I've got another method to show you. This one is great for when you want to conceal something very precisely. First, I'll grab the pen tool and quickly draw out a rectangular polygon. Either polygon mode or pen mode will work just fine for this. From the color studio, I'll give the polygon a red fill and lower the opacity very slightly so that I can see through it. When I see the red color among the black ink curves in the layer stack, it signals to me that I've concealed something using this shape. You can use any color you like. Once I've edited the curve precisely, I can open the Layer Studio and change the curve's layer mode to Erase via the Layer Options menu. Then I can bring the opacity of the fill back to 100% in the Color Studio. Just like the mask, this erasure conceals the unwanted area of overlap and it only affects the objects within the group in which it resides. Now that one section of the drawing is complete, it's time to take a snapshot. I usually do this when I complete a section. After renaming the layer, open the History Studio and navigate to the Snapshots tab. From there, hit the plus sign at the top of the window and you're all set. Now, if you ever need to come back to this point, simply open the History Studio again, select the snapshot you want to load, and then tap the arrow in the top right corner. You'll magically be transported back to this moment in your progress. Here, I'm just using the brush tool and vector crop tools to take care of the necklines. For the collar lines though, I use some finger gestures with the brush tool and I wanted to draw your attention to the particulars for just a moment. In this section, I'll be using the brush and vector crop tools to take care of the lines on the neck area. While using the brush tool, I use some finger gestures and I wanted to take a moment to draw your attention to the particulars of those as they are slightly unusual. Firstly, recall that a two finger press and hold will select the previously drawn curve and make it available for editing. Selected in this way, our options are limited. I can bend the curve and move the nodes around by either the nodes themselves or the control handles. To actually manipulate the control handles, I need to sneak an extra finger into the gesture to make it a three finger press and hold. Once I've started moving the handle, I no longer need to maintain the press and hold gesture to move the handle around. Once I've begun to move the handle around, however, I can then employ one, two, three, or four finger press and hold gestures, just as if I were using the node tool. Also, while using a three finger press and hold, I can actually select, add, and delete nodes without switching over to the node tool. This may seem a bit complicated and it does take some time to get used to, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. Part of what makes working in Affinity on iPad such a unique creative experience is the fact that they've provided users with a high degree of flexibility and precision when it comes to manipulating things with our fingers, something we cannot do on our Macs or PCs. To say that the team at Serif has put a lot of thought into this is an understatement. Personally, I'm addicted, 
And as I've mentioned in several other videos and chats, it's hard for me to pick up my mouse and do work on my Mac mini sometimes because I'm so in love with the way that I can manipulate things with my hands on my iPad. Well, it looks like the neck's all finished up. Here's a little scribble nibble for you. I've learned that if you exaggerate the size of your capital letters in relation to your lowercase letters, they have a better chance of being recognized by the OS. It's my experience that writing as I normally would, my capital letters are often misrepresented or not converted at all. All right, it's time to get to work on Cypha's facial features. As always, I start by adding a new vector layer. For the facial outline, the pen tool is a good choice. I could use the brush tool with the window stabilizer, but from my experience, that approach would probably create extra work for me by creating too many nodes. This could slow me down a bit. Her facial outline is simple enough that a few well-placed nodes will give us a very clean and elegant result. Now that my nodes are in place, I'll open up the Effects Studio and apply a hill type style preset and assign a thinner tapered brush. From there, I'll switch over to the node tool and start my editing pass. Next, I select and convert several nodes to smooth type nodes. While there is a difference between smooth and smart type nodes, I must admit, I can't fully explain what that difference is. I'm sure it all boils down to an algorithm, but since I'm terrible at math, I'll just leave it at that. In my experience, if your curve is relatively open and lacks tight turns or corners, the smooth option usually creates a pleasing result. However, occasionally, and depending on the type of curves you've drawn, smooth option can leave behind funky or stubby handles which are difficult to grab onto, making editing a pain. Most of the time, regardless of the contour, control handles created in the conversion to smart nodes are ideally placed, adequately extended, and sometimes symmetrically aligned, making them very comfortable to work with. I generally use these on tight corners and turns, like the chin here, or sometimes when I'm after a very evenly distributed set of control handles. Once I have the general shape of my line in place, occasionally I'll decide that I want a more angular or rounded corner here or there. In these cases, I'll convert the node again to take advantage of the easily editable and more symmetrical handles the conversion usually produces. All right, uh, let's uh, get zoomed in here and start working on the old nose Aruski. All right, just uh, grabbing the pen tool and the... <laughs> what the hell, man? This snapping is really annoying me. Take it easy, bro jammer. You can use the super snazzy circular snapping switch to your lower left just above the delete button, okay? Here you can see that the stroke I'm drawing has been imbued with the pressure curve and brush size from the last curve I drew. Remember that you can always reset and preload a variety of settings before you begin to draw. Here, I didn't mind leaving the setting in place as I knew the result would be pretty close to what I had in mind. To get things just right, I select the curve and revisit my brushes and styles. Switching over to the node tool has become a habit for me at this point. I could take care of this job using the pen tool exclusively, but I don't want to think about toggling the switch on and off and navigating the smaller context menu. Also, I know I won't be using it on the ear, which is what I'm already thinking about at this point in the work. You've been hit by, ah, you've been struck by a smooth criminal.
For the flowing curves of the ear here, the brush tool is ideal. The pencil tool makes short work of spot blacks. As for the stroke and fill, you can quickly set them in the context menu, or if you have a very specific color in mind, you can do it from the swatches tab in the color studio. Here's a little something that works pretty well for me. While using the pencil tool, don't attempt to close the curve. Leave it open and give yourself plenty of space between the endpoints. This way you won't create any areas of node congestion or overlapping or intersecting lines that you'll have to clean up later on. You can always close it up and smooth it out when you switch over to the node tool to edit. All right, let's uh, finish this up and switch on over to the Stroke Studio to take a look at the old, um, what the, jeez, what a nightmare. Styles to the rescue, bro jammer. How does it feel, Rob? You think you know everything about this application, don't you? For your information, no, I do not. But thank you. And yes, the Twin Peaks preset should do very nicely here. Oops. Here's a little teachable moment for you. Just as with the pen and shape tools, the previously used pressure curve and brush type will be imbued onto new strokes drawn with the pencil tool. Also, with the Stroke Studio already open, I can designate a null stroke value from the sweet little menu above the pressure curve window, or I can always use the slider to set the stroke value to zero. Here's that pencil tool tip at work again. From my experiences drawing these jelly bean type shapes in the past, I knew I'd have to convert a sharp node to a smart node and then move it to that corner once I switched over to the node tool and closed the curve. Keeping my earlier tip in mind, with a little practice, you'll be able to see these moments coming and stop your curve at the right moment in order to better place your nodes. Nothing new here, just using all the things and uh, jamming out to some prints, which I hope you can now hear in your head. Guys, I just wanted to make a note about the Twin Peaks style preset here. You don't have to use it and it's not really necessary. The reason I like to use it is is because it has the same number of nodes as the actual curve that I'm working on. This makes it easier for me to determine where the pressure changes are going to happen once I edit the pressure curve. We're moving right along guys and gals. Here, I'm just taking a quick look at the layer stack to remind you guys to keep grouping, taking those snapshots and making sure your layers are locked as you progress through each section of the illustration. After adding my new vector layer, I'll zoom in and rotate the canvas just a bit so I can get a better angle for this tricky little maneuver we're about to attempt. I've chosen to go with a blunt brush type on this one. With the window stabilizer enabled, 
I'm going to start my line from the far right of the lashes and then carefully bring it all the way around, closing it off right about here. The blunt brush will help me make sure that the line dead ends into the eyelash line without going over or tapering to a point. Sweet! That went pretty well, don't you think? Now I'm going to go in and delete the excess nodes and make a quick pass to fix the parts that need a little help. Now that my curve is fairly well constructed, I can select it using a two finger press and hold and then apply a style from our blunt style presets. I want the line weight to imply dimension and confer a certain delicate quality on the eyelids. Here, once again, the Twin Peaks preset will do nicely. Oops, looks like I applied one of the tapered presets. No biggie, things are still looking pretty good. I'll just clean things up a bit in the Stroke Studio. I start from the bottom on this one, as I think it'll be harder for me to tackle this tight angle approaching it from the left. Not bad. Again, I'll clean away any excess nodes and apply the Twin Peaks style. I didn't mind using the tapered brush on this one because the nose line conceals the caps of the lines quite nicely, so no worries there. Can you guess the next tool? You got it. It's the ellipse tool. Remember, we can use the color in Stroke Studios to edit the appearance of shapes before we begin to draw while using the shape tool. So I go in and I set the fill to null. Then I drag out a circle about the size of the iris. After that, I quickly apply the Twin Peak style again as I want the stroke to have an extreme taper right at the base of the circle. Here's an oldie but a goodie. While using the move tool, after selecting a curve, we can perform quick duplications by using a two finger press and hold gesture. With the curve selected and the gesture in place, just tap, hold, and drag with the pencil to create your duplicate. What's that? A little more press and hold gold? Ask and you shall receive. While using the move tool and with the shape selected, a three finger press and hold will allow us to transform the object about its center. It's as if we've temporarily toggled the about center option in the context menu. Here we have yet another opportunity to discuss the concealment of overlapping lines. We can use some good old fashioned layer clipping on this one. To clip the iris lines inside the curve outlined by the eyelid lines, first open up the Layer Studio and select the curves that make up the irises. Now, in the Layer Studio, we can simply grab hold of the iris layers and drag each of them into the layers doing the clipping. In this case, those would be the eyelid layers. Sweet. Now we need some pupils. Since I've already got some perfectly good ellipses to work with, already placed neatly inside the eyelids, you know what I always say, don't hesitate to duplicate. Again, I'll use a two finger press and hold gesture to duplicate the shapes. Then, in the color studio, using one finger to swipe across the stroke and fill icons at the top, I can swap them, changing the fill color to black and setting the stroke color to null. Next, I'll resize and reposition it. And then, I want to cut out a notch to imply a specular in my inks. It's not really necessary to add this at this point, but I want to see how it looks. I'll duplicate the pupil again, recolor it to a red, resize it, and then change the layer mode to erase, cutting away a circular notch, which I can adjust later on if I wish.
Sweet. Now we just repeat this process for the other eye and then move on to the eyebrows and eyelashes. Using the brush tool, we can make quick work of the details around the eye as well as the eyebrows. When we finish, we can group them together and then again group those groups with the left or right eye respectively. This is what I've called grouping logic in previous videos. I like to keep things grouped together by both proximity and location or component. However, I'm careful not to get too crazy with my grouping. Let me explain. The goal is to keep the project organized, but you don't want to end up with this Russian doll of a nightmare for a layer stack. Groups within groups within groups. I feel like if I've got so many strokes in the stack that I need to scroll down to view half of them, I've let things get out of hand that way and I need to start grouping things. Conversely, if I've got groups of only five or six strokes within other groups within other groups within other groups, this is another way things can get completely out of hand. Try to group things logically and simply, and you should be fine. Once again here, I've reminded myself to zoom out a little and take a look at the overall picture. Then I just get a feel for how the lines work together and how they look and make small adjustments here or there where they're needed. There are several ways to approach constructing the eyelashes. It's really a matter of style. Certain techniques will lend themselves more readily to certain styles. To get something close to what the folks at Federator and Powerhouse have achieved, I'm going to use the pencil tool to draw out the shapes. To make things a little easier on myself, I've lowered the opacity just a bit. This way, I can see my previous line work and use it as a kind of guide. After laying down the line work with the pencil tool, I can switch over to the node tool and clean things up. Also, while I didn't use one here, keep in mind that stabilizers are available to you while using this tool. Here, you might try experimenting with very short stabilizer lengths and see what kind of results you get. After I've finished drawing, I bring the opacity back up to 100%, group the curves together, and then nest them within the corresponding eye group in the layer stack. Another way to draw expressive lashes is to use the brush tool to paint out each individual eyelash. I won't go too crazy as I'm just demonstrating a concept, but the brush tool can get you some very detailed and stylized results. Again, while using this method, I lower the opacity a bit so that I can see what's underneath. I'm not being too careful though because I've already got a plan to deal with the stray lines and overlaps. Once finished, I bring the opacity back up and switch over to the pencil tool. I make sure the stroke is set to null and I use a red color with lowered opacity for the fill. No erase mode this time around. The fill is just a visual aid that helps me keep track of the area I'm covering with my shape. Once my shape is completed, I switch over to the node tool and close it up. I don't need to edit the nodes too much and the edges of the curve will never be seen again once the illustration is complete. If I'm happy with the shape, much like we did with the irises of the eyes, I group the lashes together and clip them inside of the shape. Then I set the fill to null and voila, no pesky overlaps.
Well, we're nearing the end of the inking phase, folks, and as you've probably noticed, things have been getting a little hairy. <laughs> no? No? Anybody? Okay. I'm sorry. After adding another vector layer, we can switch over to the pen tool and put it into line mode. Here, I'm looking to take care of any short, tapered, crescent strokes. Remember that, while drawing with the pen tool, we can preload the settings. In the Stroke Studio, I can quickly construct a peak type pressure curve and set the stroke size. Now that it's been set, I can quickly draw out and edit my crescent lines. When I draw out the lines, I'm simply dragging the line from one endpoint to another. After that, creating the crescent curve in edit mode is super easy. I just repeat this process for each similar stroke, making adjustments to the stroke and pressure curves where they're needed. We can use this same technique for long, curly, S-shaped strands of hair as well. Again, we simply drag out our line from one endpoint to the other using the pen tool. Then, rather than use edit mode with the pen tool, we can switch over to the node tool and place nodes in places where the curve breaks in opposite directions. For easier editability, you will also need to convert the nodes at the endpoints of the line. In this manner, with a very limited number of nodes, you can achieve beautiful and flowing S-shaped or reversed curves where you need them. Again, here we'll use our pen tool, but this time in pen mode as we have a line made up of a crescent curve followed by a very sharp, almost 90 degree angle. After we make our edits, we'll also need to take care of some overlaps. We can use the eraser masking method on the group containing the eyes, and we can use the vector crop tool to quickly take care of the strand of hair overlapping the ear. That is, if you feel you really need to. Hair is, after all, hair, and it gets all over the place and overlaps stuff especially if you've been slaying night creatures for several episodes without rest before entering into a vampire team battle royale in Dracula's castle, culminating in the death of death? Dang, that finale was insane. For this dangling curl, I decided to use the brush tool because I wanted to make sure that the stroke was as expressive as possible. Switching over to the brush tool, I simply draw out my stroke. I remember selecting the thin brush earlier so I knew what to expect when I laid down the stroke. Once laid down, I switch over to the node tool and edit it, careful to try and maintain the dynamic and flowing appearance of my original line.
Now that it's pretty much where I want it to be appearance-wise, I duplicate it from the edit menu. I duplicate it in this way because I don't want to risk moving it by accident while duplicating with the move tool. Next, I switch back over to the node tool and begin creating overlaps. Following the contour of the original curve, I drag out the appropriate parts of the line to the left or to the right, just as it's drawn. Again, after I'm happy with the overall look of things, I begin getting an idea about the stroke widths and pressure curves in the Stroke Studio. I want to set myself up for success in the coloring phase, so I'm going to join these strokes using the Join command in the Node Tools context menu. This will make it a little easier to color. To make sure the two curves join in the right spot, I select them both, making all of their nodes editable. Then, I make sure my snapping is turned on, find the endpoint nodes, and snap them together. A yellow color will appear, which indicates the nodes have actually snapped. Once this is done, with the Node tool, I drag and select both of the curves in their entirety and tap Join in the context menu. Finally, I'll need to make a few more adjustments in the Stroke Studio to make sure I get the line weights right. Now, later on when it's time to color this complicated little curve, I can simply duplicate it and fill it with the appropriate color. Well, at this point, I'm pretty sure I've shown you every technique I use to ink this drawing using Affinity Designer's Vector Drawing Tools. Once you've finished up with the hair, remember, label your groups and take a snapshot. After that, you'll be ready to start the coloring process. Coloring with vector tools is super satisfying and fun. There are all sorts of ways we can use our pixel and vector tools in combination to create texture and value. However, most of them are not called for for this particular illustration due to the simplified animated style in which it's drawn, which generally breaks up color into very clearly defined fields of light and shadow and these can vary and increase in number depending on how many levels or sources of light you wish to convey. For this very simple picture, we really only need base colors and shading colors. There really isn't much else to it. There are a few different ways we can approach this, and I'll briefly talk about them here. If you want to see some other interesting ways you might use your vector tools during the coloring process, check out my creative session over on Affinity's YouTube channel. I'll post a link down in the description. Before I begin, I clean up the layer stack by consolidating my inks. You can add a new vector layer or empty group for this part. Select all the ink layers and drag them into a newly created layer. You can drop them when you see the highlight and horizontal blue line appear across the layer. Then, from the layer stack options menu, it's always a good idea to lock the layer into place. And of course, renaming it just helps us quickly identify it in the layer stack. Great. Now we'll add one more vector layer and move it just below our inks. Well, I hope you enjoyed using the pen tool because that's really, in my opinion, the best way to complete this phase of the process using vector tools. You could use the pencil tool, but as I've mentioned before, what often happens with the pencil tool is that because of tiny variations in our input, it creates a lot of extra nodes that we have to deal with when we want to make edits. Laying down nodes strategically with the pen tool helps keep unnecessary nodes to a minimum. If you followed along and finished the inking process from beginning to end, you're ready to do this. You got it. With the pen tool selected and set to pen mode, lay down your nodes just as we did during the inking phase. Try placing them at points of curvature and tangency. This will help us quickly convert and edit them when necessary. Don't spend too much time trying to trace entire lines. For example, if you have a great distance to cover, like from Saifa's brooch to her opposite shoulder, just use a straight line. You can always tap to add any extra nodes you need while editing. It's much more aggravating and time consuming to hunt down and eliminate rogue nodes. Once you've got your basic shape into place, open up the color studio, choose the appropriate color from the palette and set it as the fill color for the selected vector curve. If you recall, 
I've created several document palettes for this tutorial using the character reference sheets from Federator and Powerhouse Studios. Putting the palettes into list mode, you'll see that I've labeled each swatch so that you can know when and where to use it. Keeping in line with the notes for the colorists left on the sheets by the original artists, the colors marked with C are not to be used unless complex lighting is required. We'll only be using A and B swatches for this session. A designates a base color and B usually designates shading colors. Once you've got your fill in place, you can switch over to the node tool and begin your editing pass. I tried to make sure that the blue connective lines between the nodes rest somewhere along the center of the ink lines. The goal for this phase is to make sure that we don't leave any spaces or areas without colors. We also want to make sure that we don't color outside the lines, so to speak. It always leaves a bad taste in my mouth when I have to go back and clean up my own sloppy work. I'm still working on that. You will definitely want to use the pen tool for these editing passes, as they can require quite a bit of concentration. You'll learn this quickly if you try to do the work exclusively with the pen tool. Well, that's all there really is to the flatting phase. Keep all your press and hold gestures in mind and the work will be quick and satisfying. Here, I've sped things up a bit, and I'm also being very generous with the shape that I'm creating for the head. Remember that we're working with a layer stack here. Eventually, the hair layer will come to rest above the layer for the head and face. So, I don't need to get bogged down trying to make the head and face shape fit neatly within the contours of the hair that drapes over her face and neck. For the eyes here, we've already created several perfectly usable vector shapes during the inking phase. Let's get some more mileage out of them. I'll go into the inks layer, duplicate them, and bring the duplicated items into the color layer. Then, I can change their fill and stroke colors from the color studio. The hair, being the most complex element of the drawing, will take the most time to complete. Again, don't be intimidated. If you finish the inking of the hair with some degree of success, you now have the skills to make this part a breeze. 
Remember to place your nodes strategically, just like we did while we were inking. We want to keep nodes to a minimum, which sets us up for success during the editing pass. You may notice that I'm ignoring a few of these parts that are separated from the main body of hair. We'll come back to those later. Here's a good example of strategic node placement. These shapes are sort of triangular, so I only need three really well-placed nodes in order to fit the curve to the ink lines. The editing will be fairly simple, as I'll be able to simply tug on the connective lines between each node and make very subtle adjustments to the control handles in order to get the right fit. All right, guys, I thought I would uh, take take a few uh, seconds here and wax uh, philosophical with you about uh, the node tool. And, um, you know, this part, the flatting part and the, uh, you know, I, I actually refer to this as the sculpting phase of the flats process. So doing all this sculpting with the node tool and uh, making all these curves fit is super satisfying work. And... Uh, it, um, to me, it's sort of the vector equivalent of the feeling that you get when you're using a paintbrush in Pixel Persona and you're coloring in, you know, some empty ink lines like you would when you're a child when you first learned to color in coloring books. Super satisfying. And isn't that uh, part of the human condition where um, it's like a compulsion uh, making things fit into place, uh, figuring out how to make things fit, figuring out where we fit in the world. Um, yeah, man, uh, I love this part. Um, yeah, just wanted to wax a little philosophical with you, and um, I'll shut up now and let you just chill and uh, watch the rest of this. Remember those finger gestures? They come in super handy. You can see all the dots popping in and off of the screen. Um, yeah. Thanks, Affinity. Thank you, um, Apple. Uh, yeah, all right. Sweet.
All right, all right. For once, I'm going to leave some useful information in here. Just kidding. I hope some I hope a lot of this was useful. Anyway, when you have a large stack of separate curves, you can use the merge curves operation on them instead of grouping them. Once it's been done, you will see it designated as curves instead of curve in the layer stack. This operation is non-destructive, meaning it can be undone using the separate curves in the edit menu. Essentially, the parts become merged into one, so you can treat them as a single entity when it comes to the editing process. Uh, you can make changes to the nodes, the color, the stroke, all kinds of things. And then after you've done this, you can actually separate them. Those edits will remain and, um, yeah, it's super useful. So uh, it can really condense your layer stack and make things much neater for your project. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff. For the shirt here, it's the same old song and dance with the pen tool and the node tool. However, I wanted to draw your attention to the layer stack after the shape's been completed. Um, notice how the hair is overlapping the um, shirt and the shirt is also overlapping the skin for the neck. Uh, remember, in this section, it's the order in the layer stack that determines which areas of each shape are hidden or not hidden. So you don't have to do any masking on this part. Just make sure you bring the shirt to the proper place in the layer stack. Not wanting to neglect any possibilities, I decided to give another quick demo of using the pencil tool to quickly draw out areas of flat color, just like we did with the eyelashes. As you can see, and as I've mentioned before, it leaves behind quite a few extra nodes, but with a little practice and tweaking of the stabilizer settings, the results are not half bad. I did it in this way to make the point that in some situations, it's actually a little quicker for me to select the pencil tool and draw out the shape, rather than to zoom in, tap out all the nodes, zoom out, grab the node tool, continue to edit, and switch back over to the pencil tool, etc. Here, after I drew the shape, I've simply gone back in and deleted the extra nodes and made a few quick edits. So don't roll out the pencil tool as an option every time, guys. There are some moments when it really does shine. Essentially, with the pencil tool, you lose precision, but you gain great speed. Can you imagine trying to draw Saifa's entire hair shape with the pencil tool alone? Even with the sculpt function turned on, it'd be one heck of a job. Things could get pretty... hairy? <laughs> oh man, sorry guys. If you're feeling up for a challenge, give it a shot and then tell me where to meet you so I can buy you a beer because you're going to need one and you deserve it. Disclaimer, I can't fly halfway around the world to buy each one of you that's crazy enough to try this a beer. So buy yourself a six pack and keep it in the fridge because if you do decide to try this with the pencil tool alone, you're going to need one of those bad boys once you finish up. Okay. I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. It can be done, folks, but it's not easy. Uh, okay, yeah, I just had to throw that in there. Holy crap, folks, we've made it to the shading part. I hope it's not too disappointing, but this first method of shading is actually pretty like luster. It's just like flatting, except we're using darker colors to create areas of shade. Super simple because the drawing is done in the style of a cell animation. The extremely clean and sharp edges where there are changes of value are perfect for vector shapes. So yeah, this is the go-to way of doing things. One problem with it, however, that you're probably already thinking of is that it can be a little time consuming. That being said, there's no better way to get super clean and clear areas of color. There really are no fast and hard rules or new techniques that you need to learn uh, if you're going to use this method to shade your picture. Uh, I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that I'm using the pencil tool here. And one of the main reasons I'm doing this is it's simply a choice that I'm making because if you look back at my original pencil drawing, I didn't delineate any areas of shade on the cloak or 
uh, on the hair or things like that. I think I may have drawn a few lines, uh, like one under the jaw and then under the earlobe and possibly under the nose, if I remember correctly. I'm not looking at it right now, but yeah. Uh, so I'm just sort of sculpting out what I think should be here, what I want to be here as far as shadows go. Uh, if you do your own drawing in the future, you might have some areas of shadow that might be better suited to draw with the pen tool or what have you. So yeah, no uh, no new rules or techniques or, or advice to give you if you're going to do things this way. It's pretty cut and dry. All right, so here's another method. First, we need to select and duplicate all of our flat layers. We'll skip the eyes for a moment as they'll require just a bit of special attention. Once duplicated, we'll group each part with its duplicate. The eyes are already neatly grouped. If we duplicate these groups, we can simply delete the components inside, leaving behind the sclera or eye white shapes. We can grab those and nest them within the original group of colors. After that, we can duplicate the flats for the irises and tear ducts. Now that everything is duplicated, we can assign shading colors to them and begin the shading process. Now that the shading color is applied to the duplicate, we can add an empty mask layer to the shape. Basically, in Pixel Persona, on the empty mask layer, we'll apply white to reveal the shading color underneath. This can be done in all sorts of ways. For this particular style, we'll need to keep it clean and simple. Using selection tools is a great way to do this. With the selection tool, you can draw clearly defined areas to color in with either the flood fill tool or the paintbrush tool. Try experimenting with the feathering option in the selection tools context menu as well. It can help you achieve softer edges which appear to blend slightly. You can also attempt to prevent or smooth any jagged edges that might appear in your selection with the anti-alias option in the context menu. The selection tool's default mode is freehand. For crisp, straight edges, however, you can switch over to polygon mode and tap out your selection. It's similar to the way we lay down nodes using the pen tool. The exception here is that there are no visible nodes, only the outline of the selection. And just a note here, once you're finished with your selection, a one finger press, hold, and release 
will present you with a menu giving you several options, one of which being to deselect the selection. This is just a little demonstration to show you that with the move tool selected, you can slightly resize, rotate, and uh, move your selections around. So don't be afraid to use that sometimes if you need it. I mentioned using the feathering option in the context menu earlier. I've noticed that using a one pixel feather often gives me a nice clean result without too much of that fading effect on the edges. Here I use the masking technique on the eyes, but instead of using an empty mask, I use a normal mask layer and I paint in black to conceal rather than white to reveal. As per usual, I'm not saying that this is the correct way that you have to do this. It's just me showing you another way to get things done or a different way to approach a certain situation. Back in Vector Persona for this little bit, just demonstrating what the process might look like if you choose to use your vector tools to shade the piece. You wouldn't have needed to duplicate the parts of the eyes and you would simply use your tools to sculpt in the colors. As always, be on the lookout for ways to get the most out of your previous work. We've got a perfectly good vector curve for the nose here. Let's get some mileage out of it. I'll track it down in the Layer Studio, duplicate it, change the fill and stroke color in the Color Studio, and edit it just a bit with the Node Tool. In the same spirit of the previous tip, I wanted to remind you that you can also expand your strokes to produce editable flat shapes of color. In some cases, this can be a very quick and easy way of producing an area of shade. So just be on the lookout for those little opportunities. First, I locate the stroke in the inks layer, then I duplicate it in the edit menu. Once I've done this, I move it to the appropriate place in the colors layer. Once I've done this, I can open up the Color Studio and change the color of the stroke. Once I've expanded the stroke using the Expand Stroke option in the Edit menu, the stroke color will become the fill color automatically. From there, I can simply edit my shape as needed.
After I finished shading the entire piece, I combined the colors and inks layer into one final artwork layer. From there, I started experimenting with different ways to add a little warmth to my drawing, just to add a fun finishing touch. The background has an orange tint to it, which will work nicely to give us a warming effect if we lower the opacity of the artwork ever so slightly. Notice how it browns the inks a bit. I kind of like that. Another way we can achieve the same effect is to apply a color overlay from the Effects Studio. Once an effect is applied, if we tap on the name of the effect we are applying, we can bring up its context menu. For the color overlay effect, we can change the layer mode, opacity, and color of the overlay. I changed mine to the same orange color found in my background. I then changed the layer mode to darken and play with the opacity a bit. It's super fun to experiment and play with this effect in all the different layer modes you can use you can get some pretty fun results. All right, guys, I think that's gonna bring this session to a close. Uh, thanks to all of you for dropping by to check it out, and I'm sorry it took me so long to get it done. I got pretty sick there for a few weeks and uh, lost my voice, so I couldn't really record anything. Anyway, Guys, if you learned something and enjoyed the tutorial, I hope you'll consider heading over to my Gumroad page and leaving a donation on one of my downloads there. From now through the fall, I plan on doing more from the hip type videos where I just kind of play around, draw, and shoot the breeze with you guys. Eventually, I may get the courage to do some live streams, but we'll see. My schedule has been really hectic these days. In the meantime, stay positive, keep working hard, take care of your friends and family, and we'll see you out there. Cheers.